Okay, so like I said, I'm going to do a quick demo today. Um, this is just, it's one of those things that it's too good of a, of a technique not to at least show it to you. Um, I don't have an exercise for you, so you don't have to do this, but I want to show you that this exists. And uh, one of the things that I always have struggled with with 136 is we get to a point, you guys get so busy, you're trying to get your renderings out, you just don't want to listen to me talk anymore. And I get that. But as you start to wrap all the stuff that you learn in 135 with the stuff in 136, you can get to a point where you can do some really cool stuff. Um, and the thing that I, I don't get a chance to emphasize as much as I would like is the idea that you can render out these channels and that these channels have value. And some of you have seen this. I've talked about the channels a little bit. Uh, I'm referring to the VFB channels that are in Rhino. In your V-Ray options here, the VFB channels are listed here. And I've suggested before, oh, you should probably include the RGB color and the alpha. Uh, and I've also talked, you know, as we go down here, about some of the other channels and what they do. Um, the one that I'm going to speak on today is something called Z-Depth, which I've emphasized before. Like, you always want to make sure Z-Depth is on, but I haven't shown you what it does and why it's valuable. There's a little bit more to Z-Depth to getting it set right versus what the defaults are. The defaults are decent but they're not as good as if you really fine tune the settings. So what I'm going to do before I get into the settings, I want to show you what it does. And then I'll come back to Rhino and show you the settings and, and why uh, you might want to customize it just a little bit. Uh, so fundamentally, when a Z-depth happens, if we look at the channel of Z-depth, here's the rendering. Here's the interior rendering right there. If I look at the Z-depth, a good Z-depth will go from white to black in distance in a scene. So essentially, the stuff that's closest to me would be white, and the stuff that's furthest away from me would be black, which on the surface is like, OK, great. Thanks for doing that. Why do I care? Okay. Now let me show you why it matters. So this is something that we'll use directly in Photoshop rather than in uh, Rhino at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Photoshop. And I'm going to do it first with an example file, not the actual rendering, to try to show you how this stuff works. And then I'll get into the, the real rendering. So I'm going to open up. I have a file that I saved here that is a bunch of parallel lines like this. So I have a bunch of things. It's a little overexposed. I apologize for that. A bunch of parallel things that are you know, a couple hundred feet apart as they go back into space. Okay. I also have a Z-depth. If I went and opened that Z-depth, I actually did two renderings. One was with the default camera settings, and the other's where I tweaked it a little bit. Here's my, um, my example here. If I open it up, and remember I said pure white was, was close to me. Pure black is as far away as I can get. And in this context, pure black is essentially at the horizon line. It's as far as away as I, as I can get. What the Z-depth does is it allows me to mimic a blur from a lens, from a camera lens. And so I have the, this image. Everything in this image is perfectly sharp. It doesn't matter whether I'm up close or whether I'm back. It's rendered as, as being sharp. So what I want to do is I want to apply that Z-depth to a blur. And it's going to work by doing uh, a few little complicated hoops that we have to jump through. But it's not that hard once you get the system. This, by the way, is written out as a tutorial. If you go to the course website, of course, I don't have it up. Um, so you can follow along with the steps that I'm doing right now. First thing I need is I need a duplicate of the original image in Photoshop. So I'll right click and say, uh, well, let me make it a layer from background first so it's an editable layer. And then I'll right click and say, duplicate layer. There it is. So I have a duplicate layer. The next piece is I need this Z depth to be a mask on this layer 0 copy. So in order to do that, I'm going to copy, so I have it open here. I'm going to copy the whole thing. So I'll Control A to select it all, Control C to copy it. And it would be really convenient if in Photoshop we could just say Add Layer Mask and then paste it right there. But it doesn't work that way in Photoshop. Instead, we have to go to something called Channels. It's right next to where it is, Layers. And the last channel, channel will be my Layer 0 Mask. I'll turn off the other channels, turn on the mask. And right here, if I press Control V, I can actually paste it in. And when I switch back to my layers, there it is as the mask. It's just an extra step for how, how you have to paste this in. So now I have it back. 
I have my mask on, nothing's happened just yet. But if I go up to my filter at this point, and I go to blur, and I'm going to do something called a lens blur. When I pick lens blur, okay, right now it looks like everything's out of focus. I'm going to, over here on the right for depth map, my source is going to be the layer mask, the one I just created. And now when I click on a place in the image, notice that now that's sharp and the background's blurry. But I'm not limited to, oh, it's just the front here. I could pick any point and choose what part of the image is in focus and what part is not in focus. It's a pretty cool trick. There are obviously settings, hold on one second, there are obviously settings that can, that can change how much blur is happening at once or how deep the focal range is. You can play around with this a bit if you want to. Let me find a mid-range, yeah, something like that. I'm getting blur in the foreground, blur in the background. Here, if I change the blur, that's the focal distance, that's how far away it is. Um, but if I change the radius value up, I get more blur and, and less blur. So you can kind of see how that, that part works. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Once you decide on this is the blur that I want, maybe I want it to be a little bit closer to me, I don't, I don't know in this particular context, you'll go ahead and say OK, and it should apply. We ran into this last time, didn't we? Right. So in this case, it didn't apply. So something went wrong. The problem was my black and white were reversed. So I'm going to click on the mask and invert the mask. So I'll go to Image, Adjustments, and then Invert. Now it will apply correctly. If I was looking at the um, layer by itself with the mask applied, essentially the stuff that's being blurred is masked, and, or is showing. The stuff that isn't is, is not. Uh, and that's why you need both of these layers together to create this effect. So the same thing happens um, on a render file. So let me go ahead and open. I did two different test renders. The first one that you saw was that interior one. Here it is. There's that interior view. I have my Z depth available. So let me go ahead and open that as well. You're not going to place it in. You're going to, um, where's my Z depth? There's my Z depth. You're going to open it. I will then copy the whole thing. Control A, Control C. I'll jump back to my interior view. I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to add a layer mask to it. There it is. And under my channels, I'll turn these off, turn this one back on. And I'm going to paste in that black to white. I'll go back to my layers. And I'll be back here. This is again backwards. So I'll need to invert that. With the mask selected, I'll go to Image, Adjustments, Invert. You can also press Control-I. Now I can go into my Lens Blur. So I'll go to Filter, Blur, Lens Blur. By the way, don't just pick the Lens Blur that comes up after you've done it, because it'll inherit all the settings from last time. And that's not necessarily what you want. So go to Blur, go to Lens Blur again. Sorry. I was on the mask, not on the. Uh, the image here, filter, blur, lens blur. There I am. And now I can choose what piece of this is in focus. Do I want this to be in focus, in which case everything else is blurry in the background? Do I want that to be in focus? Do I want you know, the way background to be in focus? The point is I have control over this. Again, my blur distance or my radius was a little bit big, so I got more blur versus less blur, so you can decide what the right value is. But this really does help in the overall look of an image to decide where it's blurry and where it's not. Because if we were shooting a true photograph, we'd have this kind of blur. The advantage here is that we can decide where the focal point is after the fact. We don't have to, we don't have to set it up beforehand. So I can do the same thing. Let me go ahead and say OK. Did I do it? I didn't have to invert this one. Or maybe I did, and I'm just not seeing the change right now. I don't know. It might not be. Oh, yeah. No, I'm seeing it there. It's blurry here uh, and not blurry there. So it's subtle, but it's certainly something that you can do. A couple things to be aware of. If you collage in stuff after the fact, so let's say you put a person into the scene, 
and maybe I'll do this live so you guys can see this happen. If I put a person into the scene, I have to pay attention to where that person is and add that person to the Z-depth mask so that it, they're blurry or not blurry. So it's a little bit of extra work. And I can, I can walk you through that if you guys have that interest down the road. But before, so that, before I do that, so that you guys can, can get on with your stuff that you need to do today, uh, I do want to talk about the settings in V-Ray. Um, and as I, as I do that, let me show you one other example um, using just the basic default camera settings. So this one I rendered out where I did my own Z-depth. And you can see the Z-depth goes from, from white to black. I have another version of this file, same initial rendering, where the Z-depth was from the camera settings. Well, it looks close enough on that particular case. The point is that sometimes the Z-depth, I thought I had a better version of it, uh, is not that accurate. It's, it's not where you want it to be. Black isn't where you want it to be, and white isn't where you want it to be. So you can actually override the settings. So what I do when I'm setting up uh, for a render is I pick the view that I want to render. So I've already done interior one. Let me go to set view, and let me go to exterior view two. There it is. I want to see what exterior view two looks like. I've gone in and I've shown the camera. So I go to set camera and then I go to show camera. And then I want to look at this scene and decide where's the maximum point that I want blurred or not blurred. And so in this case, the maximum point that I want blurred is probably the edge of this house. From the camera, from where I'm standing here, is probably the edge of that house. Something like that. Maybe a little bit further. I'm, I'm willing to let the, the ocean be blurred. That's OK with me. I don't need the blur to be all the way out at the horizon. So in that context, I can look over in my top view here. I'm seeing my camera. There it is. And I can actually type in distance. And I can say, what's the distance from that point where I'm standing to, say, the edge of the house? Maybe like that. And it'll tell me, oh, it's 512 inches or something. I can go into my V-Ray options. And under VFB channels, instead of having, by default, it'll look like this. Set from clamp, this will be, I think this is 0 and this is 1,500 or something like that. Maybe I've got the numbers backwards. Um, you can uncheck clamp and uncheck set from camera. And essentially, you then can set what, is the, um, what are your two values. So if, if the foreground, I've been doing it backwards, so I'll do it the correct way this time. The foreground would be 0. That means closest to me is at black. Furthest away from me is however far in inches, because that's my default unit, from the camera I want pure white to happen. So in this case, it was 200 inches. So maybe I'll go a little further. Maybe I'll go 300 inches, something like that. So that sets up where is my black value and where is my white value in the z-depth. And I can then perform the rendering. I'm not going to actually do the rendering, because it'll take too long. Uh, a couple other things to note, if you already have a high quality color rendering, you don't have to do another high quality color rendering to get the Z-depth channel if you didn't like the settings. You could go into your global switches. You could override all the colors to be gray. It doesn't matter whether the materials are applied or not to Z-depth. Z-depth is only about distance from the camera, black to white. So I could override that, which would make the rendering go a little bit faster, and I could then render it. And you should be able to see it come up. You can also see a preview of the Z-depth rendering as it's rendering. So you can kind of judge as you're setting that black point and that white point, is it doing what I want it to do? Um, once this shows, uh, I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. Um, so it's really it's a two-part thing. It's one part Photoshop, one part getting the settings right in V-Ray. If you get both of those right, you have that flexibility to come in here after the fact and make those adjustments on what's blurry and what's not blurry based on this uh, rendering. So like I said, if and this is, this is a split point. If you're done listening to me talk, you can disconnect and not talk to me anymore. If you want to keep me so I can show you the little bit of collage work that, that could happen in something like this, uh, it's important to, to go ahead and do that as well. So if I took this interior view here, and I wanted to put a person in the scene, for example, I could go to File and then Place. I could find a person. Of course, I don't have a person ready, right? 
Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm digging. Hold on. Of course not. Why would I have a person? There's a person. Okay, so if I want to put that person in, I can go ahead and place that person into the scene. Remember that eye level of the person should be approximately eye level of the camera. So that's going to be about halfway up. So I need to make sure that the person is tall enough based on that where they're standing. Probably also would be a good idea to not have them looking this direction. So I can go to my transform and I can say, let's flip. I always forget which one it is. No, nope, I always pick the wrong one. There we go. So it's facing the correct direction. Put them over a little bit, something like that. Pay attention to shadows and whatever. I'm not, I'm not spending too much time going through that part of it. Okay, but there's the person and it's standing in the scene. If I'm going to do this Z depth on this particular scene, I need to know what that person's color or what that person's silhouette should be. So remember back, and those of you that took 135, remember how I always had you make the silhouette too? Well, now comes the time for that silhouette. So I'm gonna go to File and then Place. There's the silhouette. Let me drop that in. Let me flip this. So again, Transform, I'm gonna flip horizontal. I need to make the silhouette match the height, so I'll make this a little bit bigger. Too big. All right, right like that. So now I have the silhouette placed in. The silhouette, once I have these two set, the silhouette belongs on this mask. So let me go ahead and on, on the gray version here, let me go ahead and copy the silhouette, control C, and I need to get it over onto the mask. So let me go into my channels, let me turn on the mask. There it is. Let me go to edit and then paste. There's the silhouette. The gray is pretty close to where I want it to be. The trick is look at the floor plane, and as you get to the feet, does the gray match what the feet would be? If the gray doesn't match where the feet are, you're in the wrong uh, focal plane. So if you pay attention to the floor, you should be pretty good. It looks like I'm awfully close to where that person needs to be in the, in, the, in the plane. If I needed to change it, I would adjust the gray of that person so that it matched up correctly with, with the gray of where I wanted it. Now that I have that as part of the mask, I can go back and uh, let me turn off the man there. And let me go in and do the lens blur again. Uh, sorry, filter, lens blur. There we go. Oops. One other thing. The person isn't part of this just yet. So let me, um, let me put that mask up there for later. Let me take these two images and I'm going to merge them together. So I'll right click and say merge layers. Now the person is part of that image. I'll take the mask and I'll apply it to, actually, you know what, let me, because that one already had the blur applied, let me duplicate this one. And I'll take this, which doesn't have the blur applied, and that one, and I'll merge those. Then I'll drop this mask back on, so the mask is back there. And then I'm going to, on the, um, on the image itself, I'm going to go up to Lens Blur. So we'll go to my Filter, Blur, Lens Blur. And now I have to decide, is the person in focus? Is the background in focus? But see how the person is blurring now? It's part of that. So you just have to add the silhouette onto the Z-depth mask at the correct gray value to be able to do that. So I show you this as a technique relating to collaging. So if you take your image and you start to collage stuff, you have to pay attention to those collages when you do the Z-depth. 
Same thing would happen if you collage grass or something like that outside the building. You'd have to have that to do the z-depth. Otherwise, it's going to look funny. Um, so anyway, that's how that part of it works. And you can decide, is that person in the scene or not? Obviously, I didn't deal with shadows or anything on this, on this person. So it's, it, his feet look like he's floating a little bit. But you guys get the idea, uh, which is what I wanted to show you. Okay, So there are obviously other VFB channels that come out of Rhino. Um, some of which are useful, some of which are not as useful. Let's see, it looks like it finished while I was waiting. There's my Z depth. So I went from black here all the way to white. Uh, and so that's, that's bracketing my values again uh, with where I wanted them to be uh, bracketed. The other, Z the other versions are available. There's a shadow version. There's a render ID version, which gives you a separate color for every object that's in your scene. So if you needed to make selections of a particular object, this is a really quick way of making selections in Photoshop. Um, material ID is supposed to be where all the materials are the same color. A lot of times it doesn't work for me. Um, the lighting shows just the lighting in the scene. Uh, the background shows just the background in the scene. Z-depth we already talked about. Alpha is like transparency in a scene. What's transparent, what's not transparent, uh, and that sort of thing. So again, all of these are useful. Remember when you do the save, instead of clicking the single disk, click the multiple disk, and that'll save all, all, of, your, um, uh, all of your VFB channels at the same time. Okay, so I know that was a little bit of a side note. It's not required as part of your final project, but I at least wanted to, to show you that this stuff exists. Uh, so that you're aware of it. And maybe when you get to 220 or 221, at that point, you'll start doing it. Okay?